Hello, one. This is Brian Mead with the Meek Street Church of Christ. And we're coming here this Tuesday afternoon. We're talking about God and his church. And we're talking about how to build up the church. And that's one of the things that's very important because we want everybody to be saved, be a part of the church that Jesus talks about in the scriptures. And I really want to talk about some of the things about that. I want to share the screen with you and we go through this lesson. Hopefully we'll have some good things to say about God and his word and how we need to be a part of his kingdom today. And so we'll look at the idea of building up the church for a few moments. Well, think about building and growing in two ways. First of all, there is numeric growth where we have numbers. We have as many people as we possibly can get to hear the gospel plan of salvation and obey the gospel and be a part of the assemblies of the saints. And that's wonderful. We have 100, 200, 300, over 100 plus people coming to services. What a wonderful thing it is to be able to have that and to have that wonderful time of, of numbers in our building. And that's a true sign of growth. It's a positive sign of growth. But there's also the idea of spiritual growth. We have the idea of when we come together, we are growing spiritually. We're learning our duties, responsibilities. We're becoming more Christ-like in our ways of dealing and our behavior. All that has changed because of what Jesus teaches us in his word. And we cannot have one in sacrifice of the other. You cannot have one without the other, I truly would say, because we cannot sacrifice spiritual growth in order to have numeric growth, and have numbers. Sometimes what we call the numbers game. We get too emphasizing on how many people get there, and we don't really have any change in our lives. We still have people in sin and unrepentant sin. And yet there is, well, as long as they keep coming, that's the idea that sometimes we can have. We need to have the idea that growth means that I learn about how to give up sin and how to live for my Savior, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, there's a lot of church growth strategies, and I don't think a lot of them is that this is not really my opinion about this, but these are a lot of things about that's going on in the world today. The idea of church growth and strategies, sometimes people offer sports, recreation, and fun, and games, and make a, an atmosphere of the church. So, so you come here, this is the fun church. And this is the way they present. If you'll come here, you'll have more fun. Don't go to those boring churches because all they do is talk about the Bible. And we'll have puppet shows. We'll have baseball teams and basketball teams. And, and we'll pay for all this. You don't have to be out of dime because the church treasury pays for these things. But is that exactly the work of the church? And we'll look at that in a few moments. Then there are churches that offer free food and social meals. Go to the fellowship hall, which is... It's something that they add on to the building, and they say, well, this is where we have pizza parties and ice cream socials, and we get you to come and be a part of that. We'll offer of steak sometimes, maybe, because people get tired of pizza, and they get tired of, of ice cream after a while, but, you know, we can offer food after food and maybe get you to come. Uh, maybe sometimes they think the way to people's heart is through their belly, but that's not the way that God describes us to, to offer just simply social meals and food and recreation to, to get people to come to the building. But now also there's churches that offer everything from aerobics to Zumba. They'll have cake decorating. They'll have money management classes. And they'll have all kinds of free things or things you can sign up for. And you come there to the building. And you can use the church gym, the gymnasium. There's times churches will have gymnasiums and family life centers, but all of this is really foreign to what the Bible teaches us. The Bible doesn't mention anything about offering social needs in that way to get people to come. Jesus did not jump through hoops to keep people entertained. And as a matter of fact, in John chapter 6, the Bible tells us after he had fed the loaves and the fishes, people still were following because of those things. And he goes to Capernaum, he goes off the boat and goes to Capernaum, and they follow him there. In verse 25, the Bible says, when they found him on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? In verse 26, the Bible says, Jesus answered said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Our motivation is everything. Do we follow Christ 
for what simply he can give us carnally. And we should also follow him. We should follow him only really for the spiritual things that he can give us. And those things are not what we can just simply put in our belly and, and be entertained with these things. We have to learn, learn that Jesus' truth is about living a spiritual life in a spiritual kingdom in that spiritual way. And so we have to learn that do these gags and gimmicks, and I really call them that because that's what I believe many are using. They're using artificial means, lures, and enticements to get people to come to our church or to our building, if you will. But do these really build up the church the proper way that God would have us to? And we understand that's all important. Doing the work of God in his way means everything, doesn't it? But I will suggest that there is something that we can do as far as being the spiritual people that God wants us to be, to build up the church in the proper way. I believe it's when every member has a deep respect for God. And that's what we have to have, is that deep respect for God that I know that I have sinned and I want to go to the cross to find the salvation for my soul. And then when we find that salvation through the gospel of Christ, we need to say that this is my life, coming to worship God and to, to devote myself to service to him and have that kind of respect that we need to have for God. And that's when the church will grow, is when every member decides to be devoted in this way. And that's something that's very important, is it? Take your Bibles to Acts chapter 5, and we're going to see how that happens, that the early church developed this strong attitude. As we often say, well, that's why the early church grew in leaps and bounds, and they truly did. In Acts chapter 5, the Bible tells us about Ananias and Sapphira, they tried to buy, they tried to uh, lie to the Holy Spirit and to Peter. Peter said, you've not lied to the Holy, you've not lied to men, but to God when you lied to Peter, because the Holy Spirit was working with Peter as an apostle. And so both of them, because of the lie, left this world. They both died, and they died that day. God punished them because of their error, their sin. And here was the effect on the church. Notice in chapter 5, the Bible tells us, begin with verse 11. It says, and great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things. What did they hear about? They heard about that Ananias' fire tried to pull one over on Peter, said they brought all the money, which they had not done. They brought some of the money, and yet the Holy Spirit knew what they were doing because God knows, doesn't he? God sees and knows what we do. And the Bible says that the great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard of these things, it was even in the community, wasn't it? At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. They were with all one accord in Solomon's portico. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. Verse 14, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number, to the church. You know what happens? Here, they might thought, well, this is a terrible thing. Here, these people lost their lives. What a terrible negative. What, a, what might have been a black mark on the church. It really showed the people that God is working among men. That back in that time that God even punished these two because they tried to pull one over on God and mock God in some way by, by their lie about the money. And yet, that shows people that you cannot mess with God, that we need to develop that high and, high and deep regard, that fear for, of God, that we need to have a proper respect for God. In Acts chapter 12, we see a similar story by King Herod, who was, royal, was, was dressed in royal array and was giving a speech. Let's read what the Bible says. And in verse 21, down to verse 24, it says, And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat in, on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Again, this didn't affect this, the church that was growing then. 
these people, when they saw Herod, and, and he, he should have rebuked the people saying, you know, give God glory, not me. But yet that's not what he did. He persisted and evidently he enjoyed the fact that they were uh, flattering him in some way. And you know, that's the problem. We understand that God needs to get the glory. And even today, whatever we do, whatever abilities we have, give God the glory. To him be the glory in everything that we do in the church. When we have that kind of respect and for the glory of God, that's also when the church will grow. It's not about what I do as a preacher and what others do as song leaders and, and helpers and servants of the church. It's not about who gets the praise. It's about God getting the praise. And when every member understands that, our role in the church is to give Christ the glory. That's when the church can grow. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, here the wise man Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The Bible's telling us there that the fear of the Lord, the respect, that fear in the sense that we ought to know in the back of our mind, this is what pleases God. And when I get out of step of that, then that's when I need to get back on track. You know, there's a, there's a healthy sense of respect and even fear in some regard for the God that we serve. And I know that we should not live in fear, but there is a sense that keeps us, a deterrent from keeping us going the wrong way and making things out of hand. If we get to the point where, well, you know, coming to services, it's just more of a social thing. It's more of just getting together for social purposes. Now, that's something we must never do. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 tells us that the end of the matter, Solomon, at the end of this book, Ecclesiastes, he's going through all the purposes of life. He tried to say, well, I try to find meaning in this and that and, and all this. But here's the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. You know, everything that we need to do in this life I know that raising children is important, having a family. If you have a family and you're living, you're finding your purpose and meaning in those things, but more than that, it should be in God and having that fear and keeping God's commandments. That ought to be the most biggest priority of our lives. And it needs to be because that's our purpose here. People struggle find what's my meaning? What's the meaning of life? Why am I here? I'm here to serve God, and I want to teach my family also to serve God. We do that. When every member has that kind of fear and know their purpose in life, then that's when the church can grow and be what it needs to be. In Psalm 119, again, David would say in verses 14 and 15, it says, I rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies. This is the American Standard Version. As much as in all riches, in other words, I, I look at, what you have in your word. And it's, it's important to me as much as all, all riches. David even say he loved it above the riches and rubies and gold and silver of this earth. He says, I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. We need to have respect unto God's ways, first and foremost, so we can be saved when this life is over. And in Psalm chapter 89 Verse 7, the New King James Bible tells us, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those who are those around him. This is talking about when we come together here as people of God, as we come and worship God and present ourselves before God. You know, we should never look at the assembly of the saints. And I believe we should have a renewed look at coming together. Now we're able to do that finally as an important thing. It's not a social time to show off our clothes and, and, and Easter outfits and things like that. It's not about getting together just in a social way or just a recreational things. It's not about fun and games either, is it? And so we need to have that high level respect for God and show that we love him. Jesus is here. God is here. You know, the Bible tells us when we come together, he sees what we do. That's why God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. When we come together, what we do matters. God shows us that it's important to him and also important to us. And when we do that, and we look at it this way, 
that we're not coming just to see our brothers and sisters, but we're also coming to see Jesus at the assembling of the saints. That's when the church can grow as it ought to. In Hebrews chapter 12, take your Bibles and turn over there, if you will. In Hebrews chapter 12, here the Bible speaks about our coming together and what we have as the church today. As the Bible tells us, begin with verse 18. For ye have not come to a mountain that, cannot, that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, even if a beast touches the, the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. He said, that's not like Mount Sinai when Moses was physically there. He was there with the people of God and they didn't want to be there with God. He said, you go up and you bring us the word back down from Mount Sinai. He brought back the Ten Commandments. You know, he tells us what we have come to. Verse 22, I want to read just a little bit of this. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the myriads of angels. Did you know that's what we have today? We're come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the church today, figuratively referring to the church God, heavenly Jerusalem that we have today as the church. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of righteous of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And so again, this talks about what we have. As people of God, we need to reverence that, don't we? That time that we've come to what all the Old Testament looked forward to, that time of the church, the kingdom of God in this age today. And in verse 28 of that same chapter, he mentions, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And there is a sense of a fear element in that, that we need to give God and this idea of service. That word serve could actually be referred to as worship there. You know, we worship God with accepted with reverence and godly fear. This all that we need to have before God. You know, when we come to assemblies, this should never be a mundane thing that we come to the assemblies of the saints. It's always just church. I'm bored to death, bored to tears. No, this is, should be an exciting time when every member of the church comes together with that kind of sense of reverence and godly fear and all before God. That's when the church can grow. That's when the church can be what it needs to be. And if fun and games, we have to lure people there by fun and games, then we really don't have them there for the right reason, if that's the case. Now, if you take away those things, and then I, I will say, I don't read of anything like that in the early church, people having to do that to jump through hoops and dressing up like Bible characters in the pulpit just to get people to come to the services of the church. Those kinds of things are foreign from God's word. We have to be there for the reason of the salvation of our soul. And I will suggest that when every member is growing and maturing in Christ, and we take that seriously, we look at, at the Bible, the word of God as the means of our growth, and that we must look at God's word as something that's vital, and that we're interested in studying it to grow this book is so old, over 2,000 years old, but yet it still directs our lives. Even though It's still relevant. It's still applicable to our lives. It applies to every walk of our life. In every instance of every situation of life, the Bible will cover. We'll talk about all the cycles and seasons and, and every choice that you make. You can find record, recorded in the Word of God itself. In Ephesians chapter 4, I want to look at verses 11 down to 13. Actually, look at 14, if you will, a little bit. But in Ephesians 4, verse 11, here the Bible says, He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. That word for in the beginning of verse 12 tells us why we have the apostles' writings today. You know, we don't have living apostles. They died in the first century. 
We still have the words of Peter and, and Paul and others who wrote for us. The Bible tells us that these men were inspired. They were the ones who laid down the foundation of the church upon the apostles and prophets. We don't have living apostles either today. You know, that time of, of miracles has since ceased. But we do have the people today such as teachers and preachers and even pastors, which actually refers to the overseers of the church, those who still oversee the body of Christ. Now, why do we have all this? Why do we have Bible studies like we're having now? Why do we have preaching lessons and sermons? You know, people say, well, I don't want to go and listen to sermons all the time. But that's what we need. And here's the purpose of this. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service and the, and the building up the body of Christ. You know how you're built up? By exactly that thing, by listening, by putting into practice the things that we hear so we can take it out with us into our daily lives and tell others the good news of salvation. And verse 13 says, until, and here's the reason why, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We have a, a high challenge again to become Christ-like and become mature as children of God who know the scriptures. We can tell you, well, what does the Bible say about this? We can show them the, the book, chapter, and verse where those things are. Be able to say, well, this is what the Bible says. You know, this is something that shows us what Christ did. You know, Christ knew the scriptures, and we must know the scriptures. Like in Matthew 4, when the devil tempted him, he knew exactly what scriptures to use to counterattack every move the devil tried to, to use as temptation in his life. Can we say that about us? If we're not growing, if we're not maturing like we should, then there's something wrong with that picture. We need to be mature, going, going toward maturity as it needs to be. In verse 14, I want to add this to our lesson. It says, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheme. You know what people are trying to do? They're trying to tell you, well, this is what the Bible says. But they cannot really prove it by the scriptures. Now, it may sound like truth. There's a lot of false doctrine that's out there in the world today. And people can make you believe that because they have this sleight of hand, the trickery of men. But if you know what the Bible actually says, as somebody once said, the best way to know what a counterfeit bill looks like is to know what the real thing looks like. And when you see the real thing and you say, well, and you see a counterfeit bill rather, you'll know that this, this ain't the same as what I normally look at, a, a real $100 bill. And so that's why we have to know the scriptures. So when somebody comes along and says, well, this is what the Bible says. And so that's not what I've heard. That's not what I've been taught by the word of God, what it says then we can know and, and not be tricked by those who are teaching error. And that's part about becoming, and becoming a, a mature person in Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter talks about there, says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. One of the things we must do is that we must grow as a child of God. And that's one thing that like a child, like a baby that's brought in this world. Now, if you were to take a baby home and never feed it, you say, well, that baby don't need milk. It doesn't need anything. Sometimes we let children of God without any kind of nourishment at all. That's one of the sad things. We need to see to it. They're taught that they're brought up in the, the ways of God in the gospel. And so if we let that child alone, it will starve to death and it will cry out. You know, we need to cry out for the milk of the word of God so we can grow in respect to salvation. Paul will tell us in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, here he's talking to those elders at, at Miletus, the Ephesian elders. He says, now I commend you to, the great, to, commend you to God and to the word of his grace. You know, they would see his face no more. Paul was leaving, going on the ship the next day. He says, I, I want to leave something with you. And the word of God is the only thing he can. He commends to give to God and the word of his grace, which is able, notice that, it's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's word is absolutely essential 
If we want the church to grow, we need to have every member grown. And that means each one of us are dedicated to the book of God and studying and growing like we should. But I also want to say that when every member of the church is unified in the work of God, that's when the church will grow. Now that we know what we need to do, we need to be unified and together in the work of God. And it's sad when churches aren't. When, so when churches simply are divided over issues, personality conflicts, and division that results because we can't get along. That's one of the saddest things about the church of our Lord. There's times when people have, have divided the church over silly things and, and needlessly. But we must be unified like Nehemiah, the people of Nehemiah of his age, when they were going back to build the walls of Jerusalem. Now, why were they tore down? Because the people of God were, had given to sin and idolatry. But now they're going back. God had allowed Nehemiah and others to go and to rebuild the walls. You know how they did that? They did that because they were together as God's people. And the Bible says, Nehemiah 4, verse 6, So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. When you have a mind to work, when you have an attitude that this is the work of God, and I want to be a part of it. Someone once said, that 90% of the work that's done is done by 10% of the people. And that may be true in some congregations. And I've been in some congregations, and they feel true in some ways, that there are just a, a generally just a few people that you can rely upon you, who are faithful in doing the work that God has given the church to do. There's some that maybe seem like sideline Christians. And it may be a different number, different ratio in other churches. But, you know, we cannot let people be on the sideline if we want the church to grow. If we want the church to grow, the 100% needs to say that I'm important and I am needed for this church to grow in evangelism when it comes to doing whatever we can do and, and, and preaching and teaching the gospel, especially our worship. There is no such thing as a useless Christian. All of us need to have a mind to work. And in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15, the Bible says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of the, uh, of the month, Elul, in 52 days. You know what he's saying? In 52 days, they built that wall. You know, that was a monumental task. And the only way they did that is if they were unified. If there was disunity and confusion, they would never have gotten that wall built. Everybody was joyfully working and doing what they could to build up those walls. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, you know, we need to learn the lessons from the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, you know, the book of Ephesians is the essay for the church. It's written to the church. It's about the church and what the church needs to be. And in the same chapter 4, as we've read already some of the verses, he talks about verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. You know, the church is only as strong as its weakest members. And we've heard that about the chain as well. But that's true about the church, isn't it? He says, but every, cho every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building, of, building up of itself in love. We're talking about building up the church, aren't we? How do we do that? When I take responsibility and, and you take responsibility, we all work together, unified. That's when the church can grow and be built up. When we have that attitude that we're doing this work, not them, not they are doing it, but I am including myself in that work. Whatever you can do, if you can just hand out tracts, if you can just talk to somebody, tell, you what, tell them what you did to be saved, then that you're doing something. We all need to be working in regard. And we may have different talents, different abilities. As long as we're working, do what we could. In order we do what we can in the, in the work of God, we will be doing God's work. Notice that what the New King James Bible says, that last phrase. So by which every part does its share. Each one of us can do our share in the work of God. And God isn't asking too much of us. He's not saying, well, you need to do everybody's share. No, each one of us. If we, you know, there's opportunities you have that I don't have as a preacher. 
and you have times you'll talk to people that I can't see. But if you do your share in evangelism and, and teaching truth to your neighbors, each one of us can be doing the work of God together collectively. And going back to the idea of Nehemiah chapter 4, notice that for the people had a mind to work in verse 6. And so they completed in 52 days that monumental task. And I want to make this connection. What does the devil want to do? Try to destroy the work of God. He can't let the church alone in doing the work of God in unity, but he wants to disrupt that unity. One of his greatest tactics, and he succeeded in a lot of churches, is to divide the church over issues and over problems and, and over personality things and having people come in and tear up the church because of, of really no good reason. But yet, like what the Bible says, what God did to the Tower of Babel, confusing their language and such. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 9, the Bible talks about the Tower of Babel, how they were unified in trying to build a tower to go into heaven. Well, God had told them to go and be fruitful and, and fill the earth. Therefore, that was not the right thing for them to do. And so he confused their language. Therefore, its name is called Babel, the Tower of Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Did you know that's what the devil tries to do, confusing us? He wants to get us to fight. You know, here, God confusing their language. They weren't able to work together because they, they had different languages. They were not able to work because of that. But you know, it's sad when fighting and bickering among the church hurts our focus and our work. We lose our zeal because of such things. In James chapter 3, verse 16, here James says, For envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything are there. When somebody wants to do call all the shots and be like the altar thieves who destroy the church in, in Second John or Third John, actually, uh, what happens is is that it's a problem, isn't it? It becomes a problem because the altar thieves wanted to have the preeminence. You know what I talked about earlier about God gets the glory, Christ gets the glory. When we want our self-seeking, we want to have envy. We are striving among ourselves because of various things. That's where confusion exists. And that kind of, of peace, James tells us, does not come from above. It comes from the devil. It's kind of sensual and, and devilish in that kind of wisdom. We have to be very careful. Don't fight over unnecessary things. That's one of the things the Bible will tell us. And you know, distractions even cause us to leave the work. It hurts our focus and our work. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, the Bible tells us there, when Sanballat and Tobiah wanted them to come down the plains of Ono and stop the work, they were doing everything they could. They did it by threats. They tried to threaten them, say, if you do this, and they tried to make fun of them. So if a fox comes up, they knock over the wall. But yet, here they tried to get them to come down the plains of Ono and stop. Take a break. Don't, don't have to be so working so hard. Take a break. That's sometimes what uh, happens many times about the church. We want to stop the work. and It's too important, isn't it? In, in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, it says, So I sent messengers to them. Here's what Nehemiah said, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? We have to have the same attitude. We are doing a great work. You know, God has given us the greatest work in all this world to evangelize and to preach the gospel to others, the saving of souls. We don't have time to distract this work by social things and, and just simply going doing things uh, in a way of the social gospel. We must completely do what God wants us to do without distraction to the cause of Christ. We need to focus on what God wants you to do and avoid distractions. We need to put blinders on when it comes to what we must do as people of God and only do what God wants us to do. And I would suggest that when every member shows genuine love to all the church. You know, this is one of the lessons we need right now more than anything else because of what's going on in some cities over the death of, of, of a black man, which is a tragic thing. Now that happens in the world where people get up in arms and, and rightfully so this man tragically died. But yet our reaction should never be a violence. You know, two wrongs never make a right. 
and going out and, and doing something, a criminal offense because somebody did a criminal offense never brings back any justice. We must do things out of love and serve God, especially in the church. And we ought to be the ones that are examples of what true love is all about. We show that kind of genuine love to everybody in the church. Ephesians chapter 4, 15 and 16. I'm going to put these two together. We read verse 16 already, but it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. Go back to verse 15, if you will. We read verse 16 already. What is the idea of speaking the truth in love? Well, sometimes we have some hard things to say. We have some difficult things to say about uh, people living in sin and need to get out of that situation. And we have some, some difficulties even getting along with ourselves when it comes to the church and there's times of division in the church. We should always speak the truth in love. The idea is let love prevail in the church. And what does it mean? Jesus did that, didn't he? You know, you look at the four gospels. There's times those Sadducees, the Pharisees, they were testing him, tempting him. He said some hard things to them. But you know why he did it? Because he loved them. He even called them hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah say, and he applied scripture to them and showed them their hypocrisy. You know, he did out of love for their souls. And we should also have that same kind of love for others, especially in the Lord's church. Speak the truth and love and grow up in that way. What does the word love mean? It's from the Greek word agape. And this Greek word refers to affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. This is the idea of having affection and goodwill toward others. And Thayer tells us in page 4 of 653 of his lexicon, he says, A love founded in admiration, veneration, esteem, to be kindly disposed to one, wish one well. If we'll take that, we'll have each person's best interest at heart. We will try to do things for them, for their salvation. That's what we need to have in the church is love. Let love prevail in the church. And Vines tells us it's an unselfish love ready to serve. We have that in our heart today, this unselfish love. It's not about what I want. It's what, what you, how can I help you? I'm not ready to serve you in this way. When every member has that kind of love, for those in the world, their enemies even. That's what agape love is about. The idea of, of loving your enemies even. Those you're not, you know, may even be having those warm, fuzzy feelings for. You know, love is more about a choice, isn't it? You choose to love people, even the ones that are hard to love. As Jesus, he, he had a hard time loving the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those, those ones who yelled, crucify him, crucify him. You know why he went to the cross? That kind of love led him to the cross of Calvary, didn't it? And in Bar William Barclay, in his, his book, Flesh and Spirit, on page 65, he says this about the word love. This is the word agape. It is the spirit and the heart which will never seek anything but the highest good of its fellow man. I like that. That tells us about what love is. It seeks the highest good for its fellow man. That's what we need to do. Have, have that kind of love. That's when the church can grow as it ought to. In 1 Peter 1, verse 22, Peter tells us that's the first thing we need to develop, love for the brethren once we obey the gospel. He says, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Now, this idea of sincere love, genuine love, I'll tell you, that's something that we have to develop. There's too much phony love. There's too much feigned love, if you will. That, oh, I love you, and so much lip service. Do we really love people? I'm talking about being a, a people person, loving people. You know, as an evangelist, that's part of, my, part of the work that I do is loving people, wanting them to be saved, wanting them to come to the knowledge of the truth. But also in the family of God, there's times we have to love one another fervently, like God tells us. And that's when the church can grow. In Mark chapter 6, verse 34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. That's one of the things that Jesus did, because he saw these people, they needed direction, they needed guidance in life. There's so many people like that today. 
that need guidance and direction? Do we have that kind of compassion that Jesus had in loving them so they can be what they need to be in Christ? That's what Jesus teaches us today, even today. And John chapter 13, verse 34, the Bible says that a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Talk about to the church, isn't it? To his disciples and how they would bring this into the new covenant age. That you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Some have called this verse 35 the badge of discipleship, the badge of love. And that we will let everybody know that that person's a Christian, not because they say they're a Christian, because what they do, because who they are as a child of God. And it shows, you know, actions speak so much louder than words. You can tell somebody you love them all day long. It's what you do that really matters. Are you willing to, to help people, be able to do what it takes for the church to grow? And that's something we need to be very careful about and do as the Bible would tell us to do. Well, thank you for your attention to the lesson today. We've been talking about the church today, how we can have the church to grow in the proper way, in the biblical way. I would think the things we've talked about today are biblical because a lot of things, the silence of the scriptures doesn't allow a lot of things that are brought into the church to say the church grows this way. But, you know, we have to do things biblical and do things in a Bible way. And if we're going to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent, actually this is something someone said a long time ago. It's talking about what Peter said. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. If I'm going to speak, I need to speak as the oracles of God and say, well, this is what God wants. And say, well, here's what the passage says about what, how we do our work. If you just take the book of Acts and you read it and you study it, You'll know how to make the church grow. It's by getting and taking a Bible to your friends and your neighbors. It's by showing them the truth, not just by what you say, but how you live your life. When we do that, that's when the church can grow. Thank you so much for your kind attention today. Hope you've been blessed by the things we talked about today. And I hope that if you have any questions about these, we can talk about these and understand and say, well, you know, in a loving way and say this is what the Bible says and compare notes and such. Thank you very much for your kind attention. We'll now conclude with our Bible study.